I understand that you're here to get a better understanding of the concept of light coherence. I'll do my best to help. In physics, when studying the coherence of light, it's important to understand that there are actually two different types of coherence. Spatial coherence and temporal coherence. So when someone mentions the coherence value, for example, coherence length, you should first clarify whether they're referring to the spatial coherence length or the temporal coherence length. Here, I'm showing three different cases of two propagating light waves. The lines are the wave fronts of the beams. The left side represents when the two waves are spatially coherent. And as we move to the right, we can see that they become less spatially coherent. So basically, the more waves propagate in the same direction, the more spatially coherent they are. They don't need to propagate at the same position, they just need to be in the same direction. To define spatial coherence more clearly in mathematical terms, I will explain by overlapping these two waves. This one shows them being perfectly spatially coherent. In this case, the spatial coherence length is infinity. So the spatial coherence length is the distance where the two waves stay spatially coherent. By the way, I use the subscript T here because the spatial coherence length is sometimes also called the transverse coherence length. Oh, and one more thing, don't misunderstand. They don't need to be in phase like that. They could remain out of phase and still be spatially coherent. So here I was just showing it in a simpler scenario for easier explanation. Constructive wavefronts stay constructive and destructive wavefronts stay destructive. Coherence is not about the phases themselves. It's about the changes in phase that matters. Try to remember what I just said, okay? How spatially coherent they are, or in other words, how similarly they're propagating, can be determined by calculating the lateral distance at which two wave fronts from the two waves become out of phase. I know, I know. You wanna tell me that I just said they don't need to be in phase, right? Like in here, even though they are traveling in different directions, the phases between the wave fronts look consistent. So we should still say that they're spatially coherent. Is that what you're saying? But we shouldn't forget that the wave fronts are moving. The phase relationship between the two waves does change over time. So they are less spatially coherent. Some of you might ask this too. Then what if they are parallel with each other, but traveling at different speed? That will change the phases, right? Yes, in that case, even if they propagate parallel with each other, they are less coherent. But that's temporal coherence, not about the spatial coherence. So let's not talk about that yet, okay? If we are considering two identical waves, the only way to change the phase relationship over time is through geometrical changes like this, changing its direction. Anyway, one coherence length corresponds to the distance just before they become out of phase, so twice the coherence length should correspond to a one wavelength shift, which is when they regain their phase, right? By the way, I colored the two waves differently just for better visualization. Like I said before, we're considering two identical waves which have the same wavelength for simplicity. Don't worry about the colors. Now they're even less spatially coherent. You can see that the coherence length is shorter which makes sense, because again, the coherence length tells us how far the waves remain spatially coherent. Short coherence length means poor spatial coherence. Of course, all light eventually spreads. We should also consider the spreading case. If the two waves are spreading at the same rate, they're still spatially coherent. Because you'll see that tangential lines of the wave fronts in any direction are still spatially coherent. Even if they're not spatially coherent at first, at far distance, they may look coherent again. Sure, we do see spatial coherence, but the blue one here is not the same tangential line. So there is a spatial coherence, but you're just checking the spatial coherence between two-way front points different from the previous ones. Alright, so how do we actually determine this through experiment? 
We all learned Young's double slip experiment, right? It's precisely the same calculation method. Tan theta is lambda over 2 times the coherence length. And with small angle approximation, we can write it like that, right? And this angle can also be expressed using the physical distances, d and x. So just combine the two expressions to derive the coherence length. Coherence time is the duration for which a wave packet remains temporally coherent and is inversely proportional to the wave packet's bandwidth, frequency bandwidth. So, if a wave packet consists of waves with many different frequencies, its coherence time will be short. Lasers with short coherence time are normally less expensive. It's regarded as a poor quality laser. But of course, you don't always need a high quality laser, right? Anyway, you might ask, if we have a monochromatic laser, which is supposed to have only a single frequency component with zero bandwidth, would the coherence time then be infinite? Mathematically, yes, but there is no such a laser. You might also ask, what do you mean there is no such a laser? We do have monochromatic lasers, right? No, that is not true. So-called monochromatic lasers that we see in the market are still not purely monochromatic. It's not even possible to have a purely monochromatic wave. First, think about it this way. What is a monochromatic wave? If we Fourier transform from the frequency domain to the time domain, we'll have a single sine wave or cosine wave, right? But when you graph sine or cosine function, do they have an end? No, they stretch forever, right? This is like the wave has already been oscillating forever. When we turn on a laser, the electrons are first excited, and then through stimulated emission, light waves are generated, right? Do you see where I'm going? Like, we gotta turn on the laser at one point, and that's already a specific time. Yeah, so unless the laser has been on forever, we need to somehow violate special relativity to create such a wave at a specific time. Meaning, when the laser is on, we should have a beam that's already stretched to the world end. Okay, so actually, how I just explained is not really accurate, because in quantum mechanics, our nature is all about non-locality, right? So, can't this be possible then? Still no, there is a true reason. The Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. This is the true reason. Just by looking at the right hand side, which is already greater than zero, we just can't have a zero bandwidth. But say we somehow generated a single frequency wave from a laser at a specific time, so we know exactly when the wave is generated. This means delta t is zero, which is not even possible either, since the right hand side is again already greater than zero. But let's say delta t is at least near zero, then that means delta e would be infinitely large. So if the time is exactly known, we cannot know the exact frequency value of the wave. And even if the time isn't exactly known, this right hand side is non-zero. So we just can't have a zero bandwidth here. What if we make the delta t infinitely long so we have a near zero bandwidth? Well, this goes back to our first discussion. To make the delta t infinitely long, we would need to have kept the laser on since forever ago. All right, since having a non-zero bandwidth is inevitable, we must recognize that we are always dealing with a packet of waves with slightly different frequencies. We never have a single frequency wave. So what is temporal coherence? For simplicity, let's consider just two waves with different frequencies. Let's Fourier transform these again. If we have a wave packet that consists of these two waves, there will be moments when they're in phase and moments when they're out of phase. Like, if you look here, they're in phase, here they're out of phase, but they are in phase again, and then goes out of phase again, and so on. By the way, this is along the propagation direction, the longitudinal direction, okay? So the wave packet, which is the combination of these two waves, will look something like this. They start out temporarily coherent, but over time, they lose their coherence. The time period, shown as tau here, in which the two waves remain temporally coherent is called the coherence time. 
and this is the expression that I showed previously. The coherence time is 1 over the frequency bandwidth. What this mathematically means is, if the bandwidth is narrow, meaning the difference between the two frequencies is small, it'll take some time for them to go completely out of phase. But if the bandwidth is wide, meaning the difference is large, the waves will quickly go out of phase in a shorter time, which makes sense, right? So the coherence time of a purely monochromatic wave should be infinite, which we can never make it, at least with our current technology. So now, how do we actually measure coherence time? Before anything, let me first redraw this intensity profile, the graph, so I can explain it easier. So this profile contains many, many different frequency components. But let me continue explaining by focusing on just two frequency components that are at the full width half maximum. Okay, so how do we actually measure coherence time from here? One method is by using the wavelength and its wavelength bandwidth through spectroscopy. C equals lambda nu. So if we take a spectrum, we'll see lambda 2 and lambda 1 that correspond to nu 2 and nu 1. 2 and 1 are switched since lambda and nu are inversely proportional to each other. But anyway, that's not important. Using our wavelength values obtained from the spectrum, we can calculate the frequency bandwidth like this. People often assume that the two wavelengths are close to the central wavelength, lambda, allowing us to approximate it as follows. So you might see this expression from time to time. I just wanted to tell you that this is how it's derived. We generally can't make this approximation for light sources other than so-called monochromatic lasers. But sometimes you can argue, depending on what you're experimenting. Anyway, now that we know the frequency bandwidth, we can determine the coherence time. I'd also like to mention another point that might confuse you. You might come across slightly different expressions in different study sources, and I'll tell you why. When obtaining an intensity profile, you'll perform curve feeding using an appropriate shape. Sometimes you'll use a Gaussian shape, and sometimes you'll use a Lorentzian shape, and the two on the right are different by definitions. Basically, it all depends on which shape you're applying to determine the coherence time. So, how do we decide which one to use? If the waves that you're investigating are known to experience natural line broadening, you would typically apply a Lorentzian shape, as the Lorentzian function describes the natural damping of oscillations. If you expect that they experience pressure broadening, you would also apply Lorentzian. And if you're expecting Doppler broadening, you apply Gaussian shape. The thing is, most spectral lines experience multiple types of broadening, right? So people often use the Fogged shape, which is a mixture of Gaussian and Lorentzian. Anyway, once you reasonably obtain the coherence time, just multiply it by the speed of light to obtain the temporal coherence length, which is also called longitudinal coherence length. This longitudinal coherence length represents how far the wave packet can propagate while keeping temporal coherence. Thanks for watching. And if this video helped, please like and subscribe to my channel. It really motivates me.